Hello, BookTube. I had a tiny bit of spring in my step this morning, and I did what you would expect <laughs> when one has been a little bit under the weather and suddenly has a tiny bit of spring in one step. I immediately went out and overdid things. <laughs> I, went, I went early this morning to the Brattle Bookshop. And those of you who are new to my channel, those of you who have managed successfully to get past what I thought of as my loyal 300 protectors, uh, maybe won't know the Brattle. It's a used bookstore in downtown Boston, and it's terrific. Just terrific. I've been going there for ever and ever and ever, and it never runs out of wonder for me. It's three stories. The top floor is sometimes locked, and it's collectible stuff, and the, the shop's offices, the early editions, collectible editions, first editions, that sort of thing, in case you've got somebody, or are somebody, who wants that particular kind of thing. And then the the first and second floor are just a general purpose, crammed full used bookstore. The It's not crammed full in the way of some places where you have to borrow through the books. The books are all on shelves, there's no books on the floor, and they're fairly well organized inside their sections, and all reasonably priced. Uh, and then there's the glory of the Brattle Bookshop, which is the sale lot next door. Uh, the floor plan of an entire other building. <laughs> and it's full of thousands and thousands of books uh, on sale for one dollar three dollars or five dollars and not junk the way you might be familiar with from outside barrows of other used bookstores where they take a lot of let's say three boxes of books and of those three boxes let's say there are ten that they don't feel they can sell in the store they're not in good enough condition they're watermarked or whatever they'll put those in their outside barrow uh, the Brattle doesn't do that it's a, their long-standing policy is that a thing you get in the bargain section should be a bargain. It should be something that you're happy to find at that price. So, as I've said many, many times before, you can uh, do all of your shopping in the outside lot, provided the weather is, is not inclement. And we don't do inclement weather in Boston anymore, at least not this year. Uh, 55 degrees Fahrenheit today, be 55 degrees Fahrenheit tomorrow. No hint, not even the slightest hypothetical talk about snow. That That is just, that is clearly not going to happen this year. Precipitation is hardly happening this year. And no hard frost. No, no nothing like that. None of, none of the usual stuff that goes with what you would call winter. Uh, which has at least one positive upside, which is that you can go to the outdoor sale lot at the Brattle and browse to your heart's content. That's what I did today. <laughs> Squandering the tiny, tiny bit of energy that I had, I went and did that, mainly because it makes me feel good. <laughs> it gives me a kind of mental energy, even if it's draining me. Uh, that is the same uh, excuse that I will use to the, to the number of you who were admonishing me for even bothering to make a video the last few days when I was so obviously not feeling well. It's the same rationale. I like talking to you. <laughs> it's a, it's, a, it's a, just a cost-benefit analysis that you have to undergo. But uh, I had a fun time, even even walking over to the Brattle. From I had an early morning appointment. I walked over to the Brattle, and even that trip over was fun because I was there right at the dog walking hour at the beginning of the day. So I, I encountered a number of dogs. And I didn't have my little beat cop with me. I was I, I didn't have Frida with me, my little schnauzer, who is perfectly friendly to other dogs, provided they know what's what. <laughs> provided they provided they they sit up and pay attention to who's boss. And uh, that's her you might hear. She is thrashing on the bed over there. Uh, I didn't have that, so I was able to face Mooch with a million dogs, which was a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, but I also had uh, friends meeting me around the corner who were going to do the lugging of the books, so I didn't have to do any lugging of books, and that's good because it's a heavy pile of books today. Uh, and I found a lot. I found a lot of stuff. Uh, and as usual, I shopped with a lot of people in mind. I shopped with a lot of people who were more or less with me while I was shopping. It just, it's just stands to reason with a community like BookTube where you're all showing me your books and talking about the things you like or the things you're looking for all the time. Well, I pay attention to such things. I was a bookseller in a bookstore for 25 years. Uh, some people more than others. <laughs> Frida and I, that's her you hear gasping over there. She's just throwing a full hissy.
over on the, over on the, on the little bed. Uh, some of you know that, that Mark Richardson, Richardson Reads, the BookTube channel, Richardson Reads, uh, he and his family are very kind enough to invite me up there for extended periods of time. They mainly want Frida, but they'll take me. We're a package deal. And as a result, Mark and I have had endless conversations about books. His own books, uh, a little bit my books, books that we both read and don't own, books that we want. Uh, we've gone on many book hunting expeditions together uh, in the big red truck with Frida so that I don't, I don't have a single care in the world. If I haven't left her behind somewhere in someone else's care, if she's with me, then I don't have a single care in the world. Then I'm perfectly happy to go anywhere at any time and do anything. And fortunately, in Vermont, dogs are family, but dogs are welcome everywhere. You cross the border into New Hampshire, it's a slightly different story. But in Vermont, we've never had any, Frida's never had anything but being welcomed with open arms. So she's she's free to go to these secondhand bookstores. Uh, and uh, Mark was hovering over <laughs> over today's brattle trip quite a bit, quite a bit. Uh, not just in the there are some explicit things, but that we'll get to. But it pretty in a lot of other things too. Uh, but I have I have a few paperbacks that I want to show you first, and then all of these massive hardcovers. <laughs> so the first paperback is by uh, Jonathan Rose. I have the hardcover of this somewhere. I didn't actually think that this had a paperback edition. Uh, but I'm happy to find it. It was it, all of these things were were dirt cheap, so I didn't need to worry about price. I, the thing that would have stopped me on a normal day would have been lugging them back here because there's quite a few and they're quite heavy. But I had someone doing the lugging today, so I didn't have to worry about that. This is a book that's a little bit of a a curveball. It's the intellectual life of the British working classes. Here you have. Uh, working men in a library and, and also Ringo Starr, who I guess is the only member of the Beatles that we would think of as working class. I think they pretty much all were, but uh, the thing that throws you the curveball of this book is that you would think from the title that it's a boring dissertation, and it isn't. It isn't at all. I thought that it was. I don't have anything on principle against boring dis dissertations. Uh, when, I, when this first came out, uh, when did this come out? 2001. When, when this first came out in 2001, and I learned about it, I thought, yeah, this will be a boring dissertation, but it isn't. It's incredible. The cover has an astonishing read by Ian Sansom, and the back of this, this is the UK edition, has blurbs that you don't get on boring dis dissertations, because this is really about reading. I mean, the intellectual life might be newspapers or magazines or whatnot, but it's this is really a book about books and about what people read and how we know that and what they said about it. Utterly fascinating. Just utterly fascinating. And I have a hardcover of this, but uh, I'm always up for, for uh, paperback, especially if there's a chance that maybe one of you would want it uh, down the line. Now, we're going to hit uh, Feng Shui problems here. Let me see if I can fix the Feng Shui problems ahead of time because we have a lot of books to go through here. <laughs> uh, the next one is a paperback. Uh, this is the Oxford uh, Dictionary of Humorous Quotations. Isn't it marriage? <laughs> it's a sentence. Uh, and this is just, it's just full of humorous quotations blocked out by category and then indexed by author and by category and by first line. And uh, the reason I, got, I love these things, absolutely love them, and I get a lot of use out of them. Uh, even just enjoyment out of them. Something like this is going to be an enormous amount of fun to just page through without needing a particular quote. But the reason that I grab these things uh, is because they are the one kind of reference work that has not been improved by the internet. There was, for instance, uh, at the battle this morning, a Macmillan Visual Dictionary. Some of you will be old enough to remember the Macmillan Visual Dictionary. They were amazing. They were absolutely indispensable reference works. You absolutely don't need them anymore. <laughs> you don't, there's no reason other than being an anachronistic fuddy-duddy to have a Macmillan Visual Dictionary anymore. Because there are infinitely better visuals online to anything in the Macmillan Visual Dictionary and a million things more. Not only... Uh, um, uh, infinitely better visuals online, but also walkthroughs on YouTube of every little thing. Now, the, uh, the internet has simply invalidated visual dictionaries like DK or Macmillan. Same thing with the Chambers Biographical Dictionary. 
by a wide margin, <laughs> by a wide margin. Unless you're looking for the particular pros of the particular contributors, which is a very small fraction of the people who would go to such a reference work, you'd be crazy to have a biographical dictionary of any kind when you have the internet. Same thing is also true of dictionaries. Whether it's a, an ordinary thumb, thumb through, you know, what's this word mean, paperback dictionary, or a big hardcover dictionary like the Great American Heritage that was also at the battle today. The Great American Heritage Dictionary uh, has entomologies, it has little blocks that study words and their nature changing through time. You're going to get infinitely more of that online. But quotations? <sighs> I don't know how well you've looked around online at lists of quotations, but they are awful, and the, the algorithm seems to prioritize the worst of the bunch. Whereas these old these old quotation dictionaries, the uh, the Oxford Dictionary of Humorous Quotations, the Oxford Book of Aphorisms, uh, the Oxford Book of uh, Literary Quotations, uh, the Oxford Book of Royal Anecdotes, those sorts of things were put together with loving care, and the provenance of every anecdote was, was gone through. Uh, I've never actually uh, thumbed my way through this one, but I know that I'm going to enjoy it and and use it as well. Uh, then this next one is a paperback, but it uh, I have seen this in hardcover. Uh, and probably, maybe somewhere down the line, I probably want a hardcover, but every time I've seen a hardcover at the Brattle, it's been in terrible shape. Just terrible, terrible shape. The dust jacket just ripped all to head and gone, and I didn't want that. And this is a paperback that's in perfectly good condition, so I'll take it for now. Uh, this is uh, a classic of natural history. This is Fred Bodsworth's The Last of the Curlews. And this is the Edwin Way Teal Nature Classics Library. So it has a modern cover, but it's got all these beautiful illustrations. Uh, um, of curlews. See, so you've got big panoramic illustrations, but also spot illustrations all throughout. And this is... Uh, this is uh, Bodsworth's study of these birds. The title is a little bit uh, doom and gloomy. Curlews are still around. <laughs> They're a pretty hardy bird. But, uh, but And this is, I admit, I mean, it's an out-of-focus photograph on the cover. Uh, so uh, a hardcover with a dust jacket. It's much closer to the original publication of this thing. What was this, in the 1960s? Uh, 1954. Will turn up. I will I will find a more durable edition of this, but in the meantime, I haven't read this in a long time, and I love it. I thought I love illustrated natural history works anyway, and having it in the paperback uh, will give me an opportunity to test whether or not I actually need the hardcover. I don't want the hardcover just because I already have the book. Uh, I I want the hardcover if it's going to answer a need, and the need would be frequent use. I'm rough on my books, so. A hardcover with a nice tough dust jacket is preferable to paperback, unless it's something like the intellectual life of the British working classes, where I already have the hardcover somewhere. Uh, now this next one is from uh, 2007 or 2008, so it would have been right around the time uh, when I was getting back into book reviewing. I'd been a book reviewer for a long time, then I stopped for reasons that surpass human understanding. I stopped for a long time. Uh, at when I could to be a bookseller, when I could have done both, I don't know what I was thinking. I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, I could easily have done both. I made a wrong choice. I used my free will to make a wrong choice. <laughs> uh, and this book came out right around the time when I was getting back into book reviewing. And the key to getting back into book reviewing that I wondered about at the time was well, one at first for a fraction of a second, I wondered if I'd lost my touch. Uh, it turns out I didn't have much of a touch to begin with, so I was still with me. <laughs> I'm still telling the same jokes that I told 50 years ago. Uh, and the, another worry was, you know, I obviously don't have any contacts anymore in the book world to send me review copies. Uh, it turned out I did have some of them. Some of them had moved quite up, quite up the ladder, <laughs> so they weren't they weren't book publicists anymore. But uh, they were they were amazed to find, oh, what's this? You're coming back into book reviewing. One one old friend in that capacity at, a, at one of the big five, uh, said to me back in 2007 or something like that, you're coming back into book reviewing? Oh, that's bad news for novelists. 
I almost, I almost wanted to call a memoir volume of mine bad news for novelists. <laughs> uh, but this thing came out around then, and it's from Oxford University Press, who can be a little stingy with their review copies anyway, even if you're uh, in the game and an established name. And also a little spotty with sending you uh, the finished copies of reviews. Uh, even if they send you a review copy, they might forget to put you on a list for a finished copy. This is a hardcover, a finished copy, as of a book that I would have wanted then if I'd known about it. Uh, this is by Andrew Lintott, and it is Cicero as Evidence, a historian's companion, in which the uh, the author goes through uh, Cicero's writings. There you've got tons and tons of footnotes, and you can tell by the way the footnotes look uh, that this author is really caring about about primary document research. This is not him taking somebody else's opinion of Cicero's. This is all about Cicero's legal cases uh, and what we can piece together from them and what's reliable and what's not. And uh, I don't think I've ever read this. And it, it seems like a really four square, f totally meaty work of Roman history. So I'm going to want to read it. <laughs> I'm definitely going to want to read it. Uh, this next one I have read many times <laughs> and i've had many different editions of it or many copies of it always the paperback rather a rather stylish and sturdy paperback that i would take even though i found the hardcover today i would take the paperback if i find it i will certainly see it uh, at the brattle this is a bible <laughs> i got a bible i got the jerusalem bible from the 1960s here in the uh in the hardcover it's big great thing uh, which is just fantastic for its its introduction of notes. I mean, it's it's a translation. It's its critics would say that it's a translation of a translation. Its critics would say that this is just a line by line translation of the French edition of this translation of the Bible, and where the the translators involved into rendering it in English really weren't looking anything any any further than the French edition. Lots of those translators, lots of people on that team have contested that over the years. Lots of them have said, no, I, we use the French as our guide, but we were careful. We, we looked at the originals at, at the, you know, we looked at the originals line by line. We, we use the, the French as a guide, we don't, but we didn't, we didn't just trust the French. Uh, with the result, as you can tell from that description, there's a bit of, uh, of the telephone game going on here. There'll, there'll be a bit of slippage when it comes to translations, but even so, the commentary is rock solid, and the translations are wonderful. And the, uh, the a lot of you will know this probably from the trade paperback rather than this hardcover. The trade paperback doesn't look anything like this. Uh, it's It's got a richly textured uh, cover, and the cover is a uh, thick wooden cross with the, the letters in white. Uh, I didn't see that today. The, the Jerusalem Bible in paperback is one of the few examples I know of where the paperback is probably the preferable edition. The book is just so big that uh, hardcover is a little bit unusual, a little bit unusable. Uh, but I think I can probably use this. <laughs> and, uh, I, went, I went to the Brattle. I wasn't expecting all of these big, heavy hardcovers and whatnot. I went to the Brattle just because I was feeling a little bit energetic. And in the back of my mind, I actually had something that I wanted. I wasn't looking for it. You must not go to the Brattle looking for things, or you won't find anything. I wouldn't have found any of these books if I went looking for something. But I did have a kind of a yen for courtroom fiction. And I didn't find anything along those lines. Nothing at all. Which is the way of it. You know, you have to accept the karma of the Brattle sale lot, or you won't find anything. And... I was consoling myself on the way back here uh, by reminding myself how much courtroom fiction I have. I have a lot of it. Uh, it was just frustrating, that's all. There's a whole wall of uh, mystery novels at the Brattle. Uh, and I'm sure that there's some great courtroom stuff in there. I just didn't know what I was looking at, so I, I didn't know how to pick. So there's no courtroom fiction here. <laughs> but uh, these next three... Uh, We'll, wrap, we'll, we'll end out here with uh, the hardcovers that finish up the trip. And the hardcovers that finish up the trip are going to get increasingly Richardson-esque. <laughs> uh, first, first, there's two sets. Uh, the first set is an author I imagine Mark knows quite well, uh, and I know him quite well, uh, and love his work. I absolutely love his work. I've had it in many editions. But I found three, they're a little bit battered, but I found three matching hardcovers of his three greatest works. 
uh, the author is Perry Miller, uh, who's a great New England historian. And I found uh, Aaron into the Wilderness, which is probably his most famous book. Uh, I found uh, the New England Mine, 17th century. And I found uh, From Colony to Province. These are all uh, old Harvard hardcovers, paper dust jackets. I just found them all together like this, and I'm really hoping, I'm not imposing my will on the battle, well, but I'm really hoping uh, that this is the tip of the iceberg. I'm really hoping that somebody had a whole shelf of, of Perry Miller. That would be that would be so incredible. It would be so incredible to get his Jonathan Edwards biography, for instance, or his book on, uh, well, he wrote, he wrote, uh, probably a dozen more books other than these. I think these three are probably his most famous books. Uh, but he wrote he wrote a lot of other stuff, and I would love them all, especially if they were if the person who sold these to the Brattle had a whole bunch more. That would be great. Same thing with the Jerusalem Bible. Actually, the Jerusalem Bible made oh I saw it in hardcover. I immediately thought, well, okay, <laughs> is it possible the that the person who sold this hardcover of the Jerusalem Bible? I mean, that's no small thing. A casual collector wouldn't have the Jerusalem Bible in hardcover. Uh, is it possible that the person who sold that to the Brattle also sold them other biblical works, other biblical exegesis or editions or texts or whatnot? There's one of those that Steve covets very much. So <laughs> that's a, it's a the Sonsino Kumash, the Sonsino Kumash <laughs> uh, from Sonsino Press that is uh, just one of the greatest feast of of the intellectual joy of exegesis that i have ever read i borrowed it from a wise old jewish woman uh and i usually don't borrow books and she had it with her in the bookstore break room i said i told her i don't usually borrow books and she said why don't you read a little bit of it and oh my oh my it was pure ambrosia if you love biblical commentary and biblical exegesis it was pure ambrosia i'm consumed the whole thing it was all i could do not to annotate her book i gave it back to her and just said somewhere somehow i will find a copy of my own of the sonsino kumash and i found one at the brattle years and years ago but it had no dust jacket and it was badly damaged uh and badly highlighted and whatnot it was it was not a volume i could take so i didn't uh but maybe uh but anyway these next four books i have actually seen uh at mark's old old house up in vermont <laughs> and i almost coveted them it's a weird thing when you're looking at a friend's library and you're looking at books that that you you really like and you and you wonder how much of it is the excitement of window shopping and how much of it is really true do you really want those books or is it just that you're seeing them and re being reminded of them uh, and mark has a set of books right there in the front room that i have lingered over it's a box set that he has box set of trade paperbacks and uh, I've coveted them. <laughs> I've coveted them, but uh, I haven't even mentioned coveting them to him uh, for two reasons. One, it's possible that he would just give it to me and then I'd feel terrible. And two, paperback box sets are bad for me. I end up wrestling with the box. I end up destroying the box or destroying the paperbacks. Doesn't I love the aesthetic of a box set, but I know that it doesn't usually work. For me the books have to slide right out of the box so they don't work for me and i could tell these paperbacks of his did not slide right out of the box so i just left them and i thought you know sooner or later maybe the brattle will provide i didn't i wasn't sure of it but then the brattle did provide today not a box set and not paperbacks but the actual hardcovers of the collected essays of george orwell now mark has these in a box set of trade paperbacks here I found the hardcovers, all but one of which have these plastic library covers to them, which is great. Uh, and the reason why I have I have uh, a couple of collected essays of Orwell, I have a couple of selected essays of Orwell as ebooks that, that are right there, so I can I can you know consult them at any time. But the reason I would want this this set, this is uh, volume one, an age like this. Uh, then there's uh, volume two, My Country, Right or Left. Uh, then volume three, As I Please. Uh, and finally, volume four, In Front of Your Nose. Uh, and the reason that I would want these, this set of four, as opposed to one of those collected Orwells, is because I really like George Orwell's writing. 
And uh, this four volume set will have everything. It won't just have the famous essays. It will have also all of the work that he did on my own line of country. He'll, he did tons and tons of jobbing, 500 word, four deadline, here's 25 quid book reviews. He did plenty of those. <laughs> They've all done them. They all do those. <laughs> they might not admit it. They might think they're too good for it, but they've all done that. And he did them for most of his life. I think he, he wrote book reviews like that right to the end of his life. And this collection has all of that. I believe under the heading, here you've got essays, journalism, and letters. I believe it comes under the heading of journalism uh, in these. But you'll get tons of things in, these, in this four-volume set that you won't get. In even that big, beautiful uh, Everyman Library, is it the Everyman Library? Big collected essays of Orwell? You'll get the essays in that, but you won't get any of the rest of it. This is a feast. And now I can stop coveting <laughs> the, the four-volume box set. I wasn't really coveting that box set in Mark's library, because like I say, it wouldn't have worked for me. I, I loved it more as an idea. But even if we had gone out in the big red truck to some used bookstore when I was up there and I'd seen that same box set of trade paperbacks, I don't know that I would have taken it because it wouldn't. the point is to use these things. And now I have a set that I can use. I will forego the box, but not on this last item, which is also heavily Richardsonian. <laughs> because the other day, uh, do I have the example? Oh, son of a gun, I do. What are the chances? Here, for once, this is going to work in my favor. Uh, the other day, I got this in the mail from one of you. A Folio Society edition of Dracula. See how easy that comes out of the box? That goes out of the box incredibly easy. And I hemmed and hawed when I got this in the mail. Uh, I was grateful, of course, but I hemmed and hawed. Uh, and the reason why is because I'm hard on my books. I, I use them. I heavily use them. I don't have any showplace books. And uh, I made that that worry uh, on, on the video while I was giving thanks. I made that worry. And I had a bunch of people, including Mark, who the reason why he comes up is because he has lots of Folio Society volumes. And a lot of people uh, responded to my worry by saying, Folio Societies are really beautiful. It's true. Their Folio Society editions are gorgeous. But they're also workhorses. You won't be able to break them. They're, they're, you, you might want to be gentle with them just because you want them to stay nice looking for a long time, but they can take punishment. And uh, I read about 100 pages of this Dracula and discovered that that was true. And they're mighty nice. <laughs> so a door was at that moment opened where ordinarily, it, for the, the 175 years before that, if I'd seen a Folio Society on the shelf, I would have said, would be nice, can't do it yourself. You can't have nice things. <laughs> now that I know this about Folio Society editions, if I see one that's really gorgeous, I'm going to be tempted to get it, especially if it's dirt cheap. And I found one today. So my... my uh, steps down the path of folio societies are now are now well accomplished i am now in the market for cheap folio society edition this was just too beautiful to leave this was the folio society of the golden bowl by henry james oh, just just look at how beautiful this is just absolutely gorgeous uh it's got uh illustrations let me show you one there's an illustration it's got color illustrations uh, there's another one, slightly uh, impressionistic there. Uh, it's got the, the sewn binding. I, I think it has acid-free pages, so they'll stay white. They'll stay nice and bright and clean. Uh, the only problem with it, uh, with Folio Society editions, as far as I know, as far as I would guess, is that it would probably be sacrilege to write in it. Uh, but the, the, the saving grace there is that I'm not as tempted to write in books that I know really well. The Golden Bowl is a weird book. It's it's, uh, it's a whole bunch of people whose literary opinions I respect, including one with my last name, uh, ranked it as the greatest thing that Henry James ever wrote. Henry James himself ranked it as the greatest book that he ever wrote. Uh, it certainly is the most Jamesian book that he ever wrote in, in the grand old period that he had once he was no longer responsible for typing his own manuscripts. That You can see it change in his books. Once he got a, a stenographer... Once he got someone who could type his books from manuscript hints or mostly from dictation, his books change. I think for the worse, uh, but maybe that's an acquired taste, and maybe I will acquire that taste. Uh, 
certainly this is a lovely thing. I don't think I'm ever going to encounter an edition of the Golden Bowl that's prettier than this. Uh, and it'll take a reread many times. The folio editions take a reread well, provided I don't want to annotate them. So I'll, I'll, I'll definitely do that. And there you have it. That was the Brattle Bookshop, a folio society. Can you believe it? Uh, but also that four-volume Orwell, which is the, you know, the find of the day. Uh, and a bunch of other stuff, too. The Perry Millers might be fine of the day as well. I I haven't read a lot of his stuff in so long, but I didn't want him. in. Usually when you see him in, in uh, the Brattle or anywhere, any other used bookstore in New England, you see them in the trade paperback and they're heavily highlighted because they used to be ubiquitous in schools. To find these these hardcovers, I'll, I'll have to clean them up a little and strengthen them, but I'm not going to get rid of them. Uh, so can we do a Brattle... Uh, a Steve Pyramid? I'm not sure if we can. We'll give it a try. Uh, let's see here. So we have the Golden Bowl uh, in the Folio Society edition, my second Folio Society. Then we have this four-volume George Orwell. Uh, so that takes care of that side of things. Uh, can we do this? Then we have three volumes of Perry Miller. Incredible. I haven't read Journey Aaron into the Wilderness in so long. Then we have the Jerusalem Bible. Uh, in hardcover. Probably something else that Mark might have snapped up. Uh, we have Cicero as evidence, a study of what is verifiable in Cicero's great murder trials that he wrote up from his uh, speeches. We have Last of the Curlews, uh, classic illustrated natural history. We have the Oxford Dictionary of Humorous Quotations. And finally, we have uh, The Intellectual Life of the British Working Class uh, by Jonathan Rose, a terrific book. Uh, go. That wasn't so hard. Uh, so as you can see from that pile, I would have been hard pressed to carry these back here on my own, but I didn't have to do that. So I, I indulged myself uh, and I'm going to pay for it. <laughs> but it was worth it. Uh, so I'm going to wrap this up for now, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.